Okay, thank you. Well, then now we'll turn to uh, Dr. Tsemberis, uh, my colleague at Columbia, I think, somewhat, and also the CEO of Pathways to Housing, to talk about the infrastructure, I think, to some extent, that, that, that is the big obstacle, I think, or lack of it in many cases. So, Dr. Tsemberis. Thank you, Bob, um, Your Holiness. It's uh, an honor to be uh, on this panel with my colleagues. and. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly. Uh, the panel is about peace in the home, but I'm really going to talk about uh, people who are homeless and people who, would, who yearn to have a home. Uh, the group that the Pathways to Housing serves is, um, is a group of people who have remained outside of housing and outside of treatment uh, for the most part. They are people that we typically walk by on the streets, people who are not only homeless, but also have a uh, psychiatric disability. They usually have a, an addiction uh, problem and uh, health problems. And uh, this is the group that's uh, sort of haunted me uh, from my early days of uh, the onset of homelessness in this country, which really was uh, right around uh, uh, Reagan 80s when the federal government basically stopped uh, its investment in affordable housing. And uh, we've had this uh, thing going on now for over 30 years uh, and, and still uh, no solution in sight. And not that this program is a solution, but we, you're, we're hearing about different models of helping people and this is one model of how people who have remained on the street for a long time uh, can be helped. And like other successful programs, it started with the, with the clients we were serving ourselves. We were doing street outreach. Uh, the program initially started in New York City, but now it's been disseminated uh, uh, you know, widely throughout this country and in Canada and parts of Europe because uh, it's a small program and, and highly effective for working with this particular group of people. And how we learned uh, to work successfully with, the, with the, this group was, uh, first surrendering uh, that we knew anything about how to help them. We would try to bring people to the hospital or to detox or to rehab, but it was a kind of a vicious uh, circle because post-treatment uh, they would be discharged back to the street. There was no housing. We were always uh, perplexed about the, um, the requirements of many of the housing providers, uh, as few as there are, that people who have mental illness and addiction typically need to be clean and sober or taking medication in order to get into housing. This was a huge uh, problem uh, for the people we were dealing with, so that we would refer them and they would uh, either be discharged or they would go to the hospital and then as uh, the quality of life mayors came into being like Giuliani, now they're at, uh, in prison, uh, Rikers Island and the LA uh, County Jail are the two largest institutions for people with mental illness right now. So it's, uh, there's, uh, there's still, as we heard this morning from the man who had spent time in prison, you, you, uh, you do desperate things when you have nothing left to lose. And, 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 and the people who are on the street are at, often at this point of uh, right at the edge. Why, uh, why they uh, can't uh, or won't be able to get into housing is that addiction and mental illness have been with us for, for, for many, many years and we haven't really solved that problem. But homelessness is a relatively easy problem to solve if you're willing to give the person a chance to go into housing uh, and then give them the support for treatment afterwards. This idea of housing first was really the uh, cornerstone, uh, the, the uh, thing that engaged people from the street. What people would say to us is, uh, I know what I need, just like you were listening to your clients. Our clients would say, I need a place to live first. I've been an addict for years. I, I've been in and out of psychiatric hospitals, but I need a place to live. So we started to put people into apartments of their own. We, we couldn't really put them into a uh, community setting because we're using a harm reduction approach. So people don't have to be clean and sober to get an apartment. They don't have to take medication. They just want to uh, be housed and be willing to sign a lease. Uh, it, it, it was a risky idea to think about putting someone that you see on the street who is clearly symptomatic and uh, has been homeless for years thinking, how can this person make it in an apartment? But in hindsight, what we've learned was the person that we often walk by on the street is uh, actually much more skilled than we imagine. This person knows 
where to get to food, where to sleep, who to trust, how to avoid arrest. They are, they are extremely resourceful. And so for us, really, as clinicians, it was a matter of, a, it was a leap of faith mm -hmm. to say, well, let's do it their way. What we were doing clearly wasn't working, so let's do it from their perspective. So we had to you know, surrender our own sense of, of what was right. And then uh, that, that created the, uh, the scenario. Putting people into um, apartments of their own was also something they wanted. People didn't want to live in treatment. Uh, people with mental illness often don't think that they are any different than the rest of us. And in fact, they're not. And they want to live in normal housing. So we rent apartments from regular landlords as an effort to integrate people into normal housing, which is where uh, they want to live and where actually there's another kind of community there, which is the community of their neighbors, other people uh, struggling with the same things that they're struggling with, uh, supporting them to be part of the larger community. It's, uh, the community integration piece of this is, is enormous uh, because uh, it really challenges us as, as, a, as a society, you know, because people with mental illness have lived in institutions and sort of segregated uh, from us and even now uh, in smaller institutions in the community. This way of giving people normal housing puts them uh, with us uh, and among us and in a way helps them to get to know uh, life in the neighborhood and the neighbors to get to know people who are different than themselves. I think the, um, that uh, intersection uh, is enormously healing both for the clients that we serve and for the, uh, the, the people in, in the community that they live in. There is a, uh, the, the, there is a disconnect that I think uh, we need to address in every moment that we walk by a homeless person. I think something within us has to shut down in order for us to be able to walk past that person. I have a very hard time explaining uh, that to my children who can't bear to see someone on the street, like why aren't we doing something about this person? And uh, it's sort of for the sake of efficiency, we've managed to just make some attribution about them uh, and, be, and, and walk past. That costs us something, I think, personally, as a, um, as, as an, as a human being, uh, shutting down and, and being able to tolerate that much suffering in another. Uh, the, uh, the hardest part of um, really the implementing of the program is uh, to be able to persuade uh, other providers to do the same thing, to sort of relinquish uh, a priori beliefs about what mental illness is about and what addiction is about and trust that the person uh, that we're dealing with is capable of making their own decisions and honoring them just so they can get a chance to leave homelessness and get into housing so they can have a shot at peace. Thank you. Any, any comments? I have a question. Yes, Johnny. What happens when it doesn't work? I, my older brother uh, it was born deaf and uh, he developed paranoid schizophrenia in adolescence. He's lived with my parents most of his life. <clears throat> there was a brief period he was in public housing and um, it, he, started, he started harassing the elderly in the housing. Yes. He, well, he went back home to mom and dad. Right. But, what do you do? What There's, do you do? Uh, you know, uh, it's a five-minute thing, so I could do it very brief. No, but I, uh, I just, uh, I just uh, talked about the housing piece. The, the, the really hard work is not in ending homelessness. You can get an apartment right away for anyone. The really hard work is all the support services people like your brother would get once they're housed. The, the team of people we employ at the agency are mostly clinicians. They make house calls. Uh, that's. That's part of the program, so that we visit, we're always checking in on people. Some people we see two, three times a week, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, depending on their need. But the supports are key. Mm -hmm. And the supports have to be provided, I think, to work well in the same client-driven way. It's not like, okay, now we've housed you, now you're gonna do the program. Now we've housed you, now what? Now what? 
is it do you want to connect with your family? Do you want a job? Do you want to take a course? And, and the teams are there providing that support and, and connection to other services. Another question or comment? My, my question is, you say that in the late 80s, the federal government dropped the ball at providing any kind of housing. So I guess that means the Johnson plans r ran afoul of the Reagan cutting yeah, and the, the military the, the budget the growth the and the huge Reagan military deficit. And so how possibly can private institutions like P Pathways to Housing and this kind of thing fill such a huge gap? And also, as a corollary to that, I understand from what I have read a little bit that uh, I have read in this, that the homeless often are put by cities and states in temporary things that are then of huge cost, actually. And various uh, landlords of different old flea bag hotels and things charge enormous prices to the city and state. So in a way, no money is ever saved, but these are really dreadful non-solutions. So what is, the, what is the pathway to to this. Please well, you know, take a little more time you're, you're from your experience. You're absolutely right that uh, the Johnson era war on poverty was eliminated by the supply side economics. 350,000 units of affordable housing up until Reagan, down to 50 since Reagan, and never up from that through all of these administrations, including the present one. So there's a, a complete disinvestment. Mm -hmm. The system in place for people with disabilities is a transitional step-by-step -step system. First you go to the shelter, then you go to transitional housing, and you have to, there's a moral judgment. You have to earn your right to housing. You, mm -hmm. uh, unlike other countries like fin Finland, uh, you know, Europe, uh, uh, housing is a basic human right. In this country, you have to earn your way to housing. Mm -hmm. And you earn it by treatment compliance. And for those of you that are clinicians, Complying with treatment is not actually participating in treatment. You know, you have to have the client drive the treatment. We get, uh, so that's an enormous cost, all that transitional stuff, and it doesn't work for the people that end up homeless. It, uh -huh. it's, it's ineffective. So it, it, you could really save a lot of money there and put it into permanent housing. It still won't solve the, the, the big problem, but it'll give you more permanent housing. Mm -hmm. We get grants from the government, uh, competitive grants, they're renewed annually, hopefully. And so what we're demonstrating in a program like Pathways to Housing is a way of doing things. Should the government decide to invest uh, in, in, it's also, it's cheaper, by the way, to give someone an apartment with these support services I'm describing than it is to put them in a shelter. Exactly. So it, it, we're demonstrating a model that'll work. And if we, if we decide the government needs to fund this, that would be a good way to go in terms of ending homelessness for this group of people, including veterans, by the way, who it's uh, unconscionable that veterans come back and like there's an over-representation of veterans in the homeless uh, population. So in fact, uh, I'm sorry, I'm speaking too much, I know, but just in fact, the, since it would be saving money to do it in a more intelligent way, like you are saying, it, the, the, the real call reason is a kind of punitive attitude. It's actually an attitudinal thing on the part of the people with the power to make these decisions that somehow these people are unworthy and, they're, and the punitive thing, which actually ends up costing yes. much more to everyone. That's right. And especially in a situation of extremely high unemployment, providing these services and these houses would create a number of jobs, which would then stimulate the economy, I believe. Is Pe that, people, is that housed, fair? people housed often say they want a job before they'll even say they want treatment. Mm -hmm. so, so you're absolutely right about that. And, it's, uh, and there is the, the judgment, I, I don't know where it goes from. I mean, I think of the first eviction sometimes as uh, the eviction of Adam and Eve from heaven. You know, it goes that far back. It's like they had the stuff they weren't supposed to be using and then, you know, they got kicked out. <laughs> and, and then they're on this planet doing transitional housing until they get back. But, but <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the moral. But the, but the moral element of, of the programmatic piece is huge, uh, ineffective, and very costly. Right. So Rabbi Lerner's global Marshall Plan should be beginning in downtown Newark. Yes. I think, and other cities. And you know, it, it, it's like that, right? OK, well, thank you very much. Any, any other comments? Yes? No? OK, then. We turn to Lavar Young, bringing things back to Newark.
who has worked so uh, extensively here in Newark on fatherhood issues, and extraordinary, and you received awards from the, from the White House, I believe, yep. for your work. And so we're very eager to hear that, and we do have a little time. So you can go beyond five a little, if you like. It won't take that much time. Thank you. But, uh, good, <laughs> good afternoon. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to be here today. It's certainly an honor to be on a panel with uh, my distinguished colleagues and your holiness. Uh, and it's a great city for the, great day for the city of Newark. Uh, you know, unfortunately, when I uh, think back on my childhood and I recall some of the turbulent times in my home, uh, my, my parents often fought and argued uh, over just about everything. Uh, the core of their issues were based around my father's uh, drug addiction and being absent from the home and really not providing for the home as he, sh as he could have. Uh, as, I, uh, as a result, I grew up uh, with a lot of anger and resentment and built up frustration because of uh, much of this arguing and back and forth. Uh, it wasn't until I became a young man that uh, much of the anger left me. Uh, many of my experiences growing up have uh, given me the passion to do the work that I do today. Uh, and from my experience working with fathers here in Newark and around the country, uh, one of the main issues that arise uh, when I talk to them is stability and the lack of it within their lives. Uh, when I think back to my childhood, again, many of my core or, or the core issues that my parents faced uh, were based around instability. Uh, stability is defined as the continuance or without change or firmness in position. And synonym, synonyms for stability are steady, steadiness, strength, soundness, poise, and balance. Unfortunately, many homes in our communities are unable to find stability, which leads to no peace within their homes. A couple of quick statistics about Newark and the homes that surround our community. 71% of births are to unmarried mothers. 42% of families with single female head of household live in poverty compared to 10% of married couples. Newark families with children earn about $50,000 less than other families around the state of New Jersey. The very core of stability is interlocked with economic empowerment. Economic empowerment is gained in a variety of ways. However, when obtained, it re relieves many of the pressures that face families within our communities. When economic stability is obtained in conjunction with love, trust, communication, understanding, and partnership, then true peace can begin to be found within the home and better serves many of our children growing up throughout the city and around the country. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could you repeat those statistics, those statistics, if you would more slowly repeat them? 71% of births are to unmarried women within the oh, city. 71% uh, of families in Newark yes. are headed by unmarried women. Yes. Well, 40, yeah, yeah, definitely. 40%. 42% of families of single female head of households live in poverty, compared okay. to only 10% of married couples within the city. Okay. And then Newark families with children earn about $50,000 less than the average family in other parts of the state. So, so, and so you, uh, you've been trying to find the fathers? Yes, we have been trying to find the fathers. We have a, a Newark Comprehensive Center for Fathers here in the city where we work with men who have uh, either had trouble throughout life, about 90% of the men that we do work with are ex-offenders. And our core goals are to, to reunite them with their children uh -huh. We're not necessarily uh, pushing a relationship between father and mother, but we do uh, express the importance of men being involved uh -huh. in the lives of their children, uh -huh. giving back to their community, and being able to work and maintain mm -hmm. uh, stable employment for the sake of their, their household. Uh -huh. yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, is it, is there a, do you have a figure of the percentage of the fathers that might be in jail? For drug-related things, for example, or in um drug-related fences are are huge, uh, particularly in the state of New Jersey. I think the the population is about 50 to 60 percent are uh, incarcerated men are in prison because of drug offenses. Right, 50 yeah. to 60 percent yeah, of them. Yeah. It's a mm -hmm. large percentage. Right. Wow. Uh, we have time now for this general discussion. Oh no, Samal Imam. What am I saying? Tamal Imam. 
It's time now for Somali mom. Um, actually, you were one or two back, but my numbering, I apologize. But now you, you are the anchor woman, so please, please go ahead, and you have actually a good amount of time. Thank you. Thank you. We're, you're, we're very, <laughs> Somali mom has helped so many women who have been in trouble and enslaved, actually, in Asia by the, some of the dreadful international things. We're so thankful to you that you came all the way from Cambodia to us and so grateful for your presence. And so please take a little more time and tell us your story. Please tell us your story. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. It's great to talk about. I'm so excited to talk about peace in home. I don't have home, I don't have peace in my life. So it's not easy. I was born in the forest. No home, no peace. Stay in the street, grow up, and then after sold in the brothel, stay in the cage, in the jail for many years. I don't know. Just in 1991 that I had been escaped from the brothel. So forgive me if I'm not good on that, but you know, for my experience, peace, in our country, we don't, we don't have even this word. It's not easy to translate to Cambodia. So for me to understand all of this word, it's made me like peace. Did we have peace in our country? So peace in home is big. It's big and then I think that all the people are always have a dream to have peace, to have home, and to have peace in the home. But by our experience, and still right now in Cambodia, in my, my own country, I just landing last night. Before I'm landing, a few days ago, I was in the Thai border to see our girl had been, who had been saved from the brothel. They learn in the center, we then decorate them. 10 years, they have successful in the business. One bomb, they die. So sit here, listen from all of you. I feel like I want to bring it to my girl. Really want to bring it to them. So it's not easy. And then, but today, today I have it. But for me, peace, I think peace is, is in the mind, not in everywhere. If you mind, I don't know how to say, how to explain to you all of this. When the girl, they come to the center, you know, they have been raped, abused, three, four, five years old. 10 years old, it's like my life. It's not easy to teach them to stand up. It's not easy to, we have the psychologue, we have the psychiatrist, we have meditation, we have everything. But the broken heart is a broken heart. Believe me, I try to tell all my team here in New York, when you have the scar outside in your skin, you can go and you can operate it. The scar inside is, you can take years, years, and years. And I also just want to let you know that saving the girl from the brothel who have been broken like us, you can take five minutes to save them, make you five years, 10 years to recover them. And so to discover this girl is not just, it's not just helping them, give them a center, give them a food, it's, you can heal them. By my experience, is to helping to heal them is like by passion, compassion, but love. Love is the first. And then I always teach my girl. You know, I just healed myself a few years ago, and I was healed in New York in in state because the people love me, and I feel it. They have confidence to me that I feel it that I have been here day by day. It's not one year, two years we can heal the people. So loving them, listen to them, being with them all the time. We need everything. We need psychiatry, we need psychology, we need meditation. I need the park to come in my office, in, in our country to help the girl. He will come one day. But it's still not easy. So how we do it every day? For my work, because this girl, they have, they never feeling about peace about love, about home, because they have been sold when they were five, three years old. And they are far away from home, and their parents sold them. Their father raped them. So to, to teach them to have peace is not easy. 
Today my work is empower the survivor, empower them, because you, all of you empower me. I'm just one, but I try to empower others. Try to empower them too. We empower them, they empower another. So right now we, we have the center in Cambodia. Free center, we have more than 7,000 girls, children and girls that we try to build, to build a family, to build, to build like loving family and also peace. But the peace is in the mind and the peace, what we teach them, first of all, try to forgive, to forgive the people around you. Because all these girls, they were suffering too much. So they are upset with everyone. They have no trust, nothing. When they look at you, when you come talk to them, they say, who you are? Did you know my suffering in my heart? So they feel very, very upset. And sometimes this girl can make also another suffer too because of they have been through many things. So for me, peace is forgive the people, forgive it, forgive them and then try to help the survivor, try to be all together. You know, I'm here, I'm so happy to be here with all of you. I'm lucky to have with these famous people. And I know that one day, all of us together, we can inspire people just together, that we can, we can have peace, just together that we can work on corporations, and then give love and give hope to all those victims. And we still need it. Today we are in New York, but a lot of the kids, a lot of the children still need a lot of things. You know, I, I'm just one of survivor in my own country, but in Africa and everywhere, we have a lot of people who suffer. So for me, all of you come here to listen to all of, to all of us. Just bring the idea back, try to save the people. You try to, just try to save once and then after you can save many. So peace for me first, first of all in the mind. Forgive the people, forgive yourself that you can live with the peace and the real peace and bright in your heart. Thank you. Salute you for your courageous, courageous life, really. I read your wonderful book. She has a marvelous book that everyone should read. It's very moving. It's, it's painful to read, but it's marvelous. Your Holiness, do you have some thoughts? Um, I'm very moved and also impressed by all of you sharing from your own personal experience of being at the forefront of doing this kind of altruistic work for the benefit of those, especially the ones who are in real need. Oh, really wonderful, wonderful. And then the Cambodian lady, uh, the unfortunate sort of the experience transformed into a lot of real determination uh, and extend helping others. Oh, that's really because selfless, because of that altruistic sort of act. act. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. So I think it is important to make known more people these individuals experience and uh, work, I think more people then, uh, more, people should. Uh, more people should know, then I think more people get some kind of Because uh, the, the, the why it is important that more people should know your experiences, that it will give people a hope 
so that they won't uh -huh. kind of, you know, fall into the temptation thinking that there is no hope, nothing uh -huh. can be done. Uh -huh. So, huh? that's all. We have a little time for general conversation. Anyone want to speak? Yes, Nancy, please. The opening remarks and the closing remarks both um, brought to the forefront the um, plight of women who found themselves in bondage in some form. Um, and felt there could possibly be no mis escape. Um, Laurie Boddy talked about the woman in prison who said her, she s thought her options were suicide or homicide. And Somali, you escaped or were rescued? Escaped. Escaped. But you talked about peace being in the mind. And so I've been thinking since your opening remarks, if that woman in prison could have found any peace in her mind or her, in her circumstance, if, is there any sense that she could have had a third option? Um, and if you hadn't found the one you did, how you would have maintained peace in your mind until an opportunity presented itself. So the, the two ends of the panel and the experiences is there any way to put them together to offer something to the first woman from your experience of escaping? Is that, is that making any sense <laughs> as a, a discussion point? Maybe. Do you want me to answer you? Yes. If anyone, if Smiley or, or Bali. Yes, Bali. Um, I, just like, I just want to explain to you that to escape from the Brussels where I am, because I was destroyed. I never have idea to escape from the Brussels, never. Because why I had to escape? I was, I don't have parents, I don't have family. I need home, I don't have home. But the day my friend, my best friend of mine had been killed in front of me, like behind me, you know. That's the day that I have idea that I had to run away. So I just ran away this, this night that she had been killed in front of me run away to take a gun and kill them back. It's not run away to survive. For me, survive for what? I'm suffering too much. But by my work, by helping the girl, is helping myself. Mm -hmm. It's what I'm doing every day now. I'm so great. I'm so great because the girl give me love. They teach me how to stand up. And by all the people around here, by the reality of the people, they come to me. And they show me they have, you know, sometimes I don't understand your language. Because English, I just started to speak a few years ago without going to school. But I can feel from their eyes. I can feel from their heart. And that also is healing me. So for me, if you can pass to all the victims and survivors, try to open your mind and try to forgive the people around it. Why you have to hate these people? You suffer already in your, in your body, in your mind. You suffer already enough. Take it out, forgive them. Try to get them involved in your work and helping them. So I have many of the men that come to me. Now they work for me. And that is, I think, the best way is empower these people. Take them, take them to come and work with you. Thank you, thank you. Um, Dr. Ibadi. Dr. Ibadi has a, has a comment. Please. امروز صبح و همچنین امروز چندین بار صحبت از این شد که باید بخشید و دوست داشت حتی کسانی رو که ظلم کردند. This morning and also this afternoon, right now, we were speaking about forgiveness, to forgive and to love those who have done injustice to us. اما گاهی از اوقات هست که بخشیدن عمل درستی نیست. But there are times when forgiving is not the right thing to do. 
و اون زمانی است که ظلم داره ادامه پیدا میکنه. And that's when injustice goes on and continues. با عنوان مثال الان در سوریه یک جنگی است علیه دیکتاتور. For example, right now in Syria there's a war going on against the dictator. تعداد زیادی از مردم کشته شدند و حدود 9000 نفر رو دستگیر کردند. A huge number of people have been killed and approximately 9000 people have been apprehended. حالا شما انتظار دارید خانواده ای که دو تا جوونش رو از دست داده کشته شده و سه نفر دیگر هم تو زندانن ما به این خانواده بگیم که اسد رو ببخشه Do you expect a family who has lost two young people and also has three other members of their family in prison to forgive Assad? بخشیدن ظالم در این شرایط یعنی این است که کمک کنیم که ظلم ادامه پیدا کنه. If we forgive the oppressor, it means that we are contributing to the continuation of injustice. بنابراین بنابراین ما زمانی می توانیم صحبت از بخشش بکنیم که ظلمی تمام شده و ما از اون مرحله عبور کردیم. Therefore we can only speak about forgiveness once we have passed this stage and injustice has come to an end. ولی کم وقتی که در حال عبور از مرحله ستم دیدگی هستیم بخشش اصلا کار درستی نیست برای اینکه اجازه میده که ظالم به کارش ادامه بده. But while we are still in the process of leaving or in the process of injustice, it is not correct to forgive that person because that means we want him to continue. البته منظور من این نیست که ما هم متقابلا دست به خشونت بزنیم. Of course, I don't mean that we should resort to violence as well. اما بخشیدن ظالم در حالتی که ظلم ادامه داره یعنی اینکه ما اجازه میدیم تو باز هم ظلم بکنی. But forgiving the oppressor while he is committing injustice means that we permit you to continue. و بنابراین زمان بخشیدن بسیار مهمه. Therefore, the time of forgiveness is very important. Thank you, thank you. Yes, Gloria Todi. Gloria Todi has something to comment. Yeah, I, I, I think it's an incredibly complicated subject, the issue of forgiveness. Um, I'll tell you just a personal. I was sexually assaulted by a member of the Salvadoran death squads when I worked in Central America in the 80s. The death squads, of course, were trained by the U.S. military, the, uh, US, the U.S. government and military. No offense. <laughs> I, I cannot say that I forgave that person. I probably would say today I have not forgiven that person. However, I never wished him ill or dead. I wished him brought before justice. I think part of, from, from my perception, the way to a possibility of forgiveness is justice. It's when oppression continues with impunity and fosters more oppression and more impunity that it gets out of control. I also had one friend who was um, in Spain, and it was New Year's. She was with a friend, she was an American. She, all she could say was, you know, hola y adios y donde esta la cerveza? Where is the beer? <laughs> and she was taken and raped by two Spanish men who urinated on her and threw her naked in the streets of this town she did not know. I have to say for, um, 15 or so years, those men I did want to do harm to. I wished to find them and do something to their male parts. <laughs> I, however, finally recognized that 
wanting that revenge would only make me them. I didn't want to be them, but I still wish that they had been brought to justice and did not be able to rape my friend with impunity. Thank you, Gordon. Well, well time, is, time is up. And, On that cheery uh, note. What? On that cheery note. <laughs> no. Well, um, we could just say that uh, among the different wars that we need peace from, one of them is the war on drugs, which is a completely stupid thing and has been for decades. <laughs> nothing but a, nothing but a race, uh, an excuse for racial oppression, basically, and destroyed several, it's destroying Mexico now and Peru. So that we can cheer up by thinking about that, how stupid that is. And then the second thing is that there should be a cessation of the war on women yes. in the planet. And I'm, what, what your story has made, been making me think of uh, Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wooden and that Half the Sky wonderful book and all of the things that he writes. And here we have a true veteran and a warrior in that, in Somali mom. So I'd just like to salute you in conclusion. You show there is hope from this kind of enslavement. And, and maybe a final point, if I can make, if I have to stop, and uh, is that militarism breaks countries and it turns men into, you know, enemies of women, I'm afraid, because they become hardened to and har hardened and callous in cruelty and therefore seek some sort of release in some brutal manner, tend to. And there seems to be no antidote to that. It seems very difficult to find the antidote to that. And in my personal experience, uh, not that I have done that, but his holiness likes to tease me that among the ex-monks that he knows, I'm the most enthusiastic about monasticism. <laughs> and, and in fact, however, I did discover in, in, under challenge from some sociologists actually at Columbia, that in history, almost the only antidote in any nation for militarism, because the family is too weak, it's small, and it, you know, there's a mother and a father and some uncles, and they can't stand against a militarized state. They're not strong enough. The children are threatened, the women are threatened, and the men join them. But the monastic system in different situations, in Tibet and Mongolia, did manage to demilitarize states in the past. And in a way, if you don't see, people don't understand that if you think it's just a religious thing, that's like an education system of men to conquer themselves instead of conquering other people. And it actually does work against against militarism and therefore the war on women, which indirectly comes once a country is broken. And so His Holiness wouldn't say that because he is a monk and he has, it by miracle, he has preserved the monastic focus of Tibetan society in exile, which is a, a miraculous, sociologically speaking, a, a miraculous thing that he has done, in spite of, <laughs> it, it is, in, in spite of, uh, in spite of ex-monks like me and Tupten. <laughs> We're bad. We didn't manage. But His Holiness sets this marvelous example of self-restraint and of teaching people in large institutions self-restraint. And this does account for the wonderful peace-like quality of Tibetan culture, which is why I think, we, and therefore it's related on an institutional level to the, the presence of Your Holiness that inspires us all so much and, and, and is inspiring this conference. So I couldn't close the session on the family without mentioning that that institution that is, was in, is not just Buddhist, the Christians, other religions have them, of taking the men who might otherwise be in armies and turning them into brothers and sisters of all people and therefore non-abusers of women, you know, hopefully for the most part. Okay, that's all. I just want to close with that. Thank you all very much. And, uh, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. And all the best. And thanks to the Tibet House staff and the people organizing you for your workshops and organizing all of this. Tremendous job.